This is We the Sales Engineers Podcast, show 44. Welcome to We the SE's Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Marjaba. According to our oldest son, Ramsey is a superhero daddy. Hello, SE Nation. Welcome to We the SE's Podcast. My name is Ramsey Marjaba. If you've never heard this before, we the SEs is a resource for sales engineers by sales engineers where I interview guests and discuss different tips and tactics for sales engineering. If you hear me sort of whispering and you hear noise in the background, that's because I'm sitting in the middle of my brother in law's living room and my brother in law just had a brand new baby, so which is why I'm very quiet. I don't want to get kicked out from here. Moving on. Tip of the day is, as it's been for the last few weeks, is sign up to the book club. I am reading a book a month, and I'm posting the review on We the SE's forum. Once you sign up to the book club, you will have access to that forum, and you'll be like, able to submit your own book reports, share information with other SEs. It's a way for us to build a community community together, since there aren't that many communities out there for sales engineers. I have a quick shout out for Tony Gonzalez who is part of the book club and use this thing called a public library. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but he ordered the first book on the book club list, which is mastery and technical sales through his public library and the hashtag he used was try it before you buy it. So that's cool. If you want to join the book club, you can go to we, the sales engineers.com slash book club and sign up there. Today's guest is Salim Manji, and today is not your traditional interview where I ask questions about sales engineering per se. It's more about career path. Uh, we discuss a lot about how career, how Salim made his way to sales engineering and then moved beyond that to different roles, what he enjoyed about each position along the way, and why he made certain decisions to get to where he he is today. Notes for everything discussed will be at we the SEs dot com slash show forty four. And so without any jibber jabber or any more jibber jabber, let's get on with the show. Good morning, Salim. How are you today? I'm very good, Ramsey. How are you? I'm excellent. Um, so do you mind introducing yourself to the folks listening? Yeah, absolutely. Salim Manji. So I'm currently working at Idemia, which is one of the SIM suppliers one of the major SIM vendors in the industry, and I've had multiple roles prior to that, and I'm sure we'll get into that in some of the conversation. Perfect. That was short and sweet. So <laughs> wh- where, what, 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 where did you start in, in your career? Yeah, so I would say the start of my career, I was in grad school. I was actually doing a PhD at Rutgers. I had uh, done my undergrad and master's in electrical engineering at Waterloo. And I decided to continue on with my education. I was still curious to kind of, you know, go further than that. So I did uh, apply to a bunch of U.S. universities, got accepted into a few, and uh, decided to attend Rutgers for my Ph.D. in electrical engineering. So I'd say my career started during my summer internships during, uh, during my Ph.D. Fortunately, being in a graduate school program, we got some pretty good job opportunities out of that. Like, so my first year at Rutgers, I had applied to two internship opportunities. One was local at Lucent at the time, and the other one was in San Diego at Qualcomm, right? And uh, Lucent just happened to go faster in the process, and they they, uh, made me an offer, and I accepted it. I was still in the interview process with Qualcomm, so I'm not sure if I would have gotten an opportunity there, but I decided to take the position at Lucent. So I would say that that was a credible first job. It wasn't really an internship because we were graduate students and uh, we were doing, you know, some interesting work there. And the intent for Lucent, I think, definitely was to look for opportunities to bring on the next batch of full-time employees, right? So they definitely had a fairly good progression from the internship to full-time position. So I ended up uh, being an intern there for, for three summers during my, uh, during my PhD, and I was with the Advanced Wireless Technology Group which was kind of a branch of Bell Labs. And it was during the days when 3G was still coming around. So this is, you know, some time ago. But uh, we were basically uh, 
exploring kind of new cellular technology that would eventually make its way into the aquatic development groups at Lucent, which were largely focused on developing base station and core network products for the, you know, for the large MNOs around the world, right? So I would say that was really the start of my career in the industry as far as kind of a first credible job that I was actually qualified, you know, con- to contribute to. So why you are based out of Canada. You went to university in Canada to do your bachelor's and master's. Why did you decide did. to go to go to the U.S. for your Ph.D.? You know, more curiosity than anything else, right? I've kind of tried to maintain a, an approach of doing things that I found interesting and not overthinking things and just giving it a try. So I had done my bachelor's at, at, at uh, Waterloo. They had a great opportunity for me to actually start my master's research uh, topic while I was in the last year of my bachelor's degree. So I was able to finish my master's degree pretty quickly. It only took me 16 months to do it, right? And at that time, I had a choice of, you know, looking for a job or continuing on with my education. And I thought, okay, I don't want to stay at Waterloo to do my PhD. I've been there for long enough. It's time to try something else. And I thought, you know, I probably have limited opportunities to see what, you know, university life is like in the U.S. So I just decided to apply to a bunch of PhD programs in the U.S. I applied to four. I got into two. It was Rutgers in Maryland. And I took a road trip to go see the two universities, one in New Jersey, one just outside of D.C. And and I liked Rutgers. I thought it was a really nice campus, really good research group. They had a specialized wireless research group there. And I thought, I'm just going to go for it. And to be truthful, Ramsey, I, I didn't have any other expectation, but if this really is terrible and I really don't enjoy it, I would just come back home and look for a job, right? So I went with just the attitude of just giving it a try and seeing how it goes, figuring that um, I have nothing to lose, right? I'm, I might as well. If I'm curious to know what it's like, I might as well go give it a try. And that's that's what really, you know, kind of was my motivation to do that, right? Nice. Uh, you, then you graduated and you went to work for Lucent. Were you in research and development there, or were just we were research? we were? Yeah, I was. So basically, the way that Lucent worked at the time, which was really good, was they had the core Bell Labs R and D group, and Bell Labs was almost like the equivalent of a private sector university like research lab right they had a lot of autonomy to choose like you know quite uh you know pure r d projects that were looking out quite far in a number of different kind of core principles right and we were part of the business unit but we were the uh kind of forward-looking part of the business unit. we were called advanced wireless uh technology right and we were quite closely with our bell labs counterparts who were working on uh, R&D topics for for wireless. For example, at the time, MIMO was a big topic, right? We worked very closely with the uh, group at uh, at uh, Bell Labs that was doing, uh, you know, MIMO decoding algorithms, right? So they were patenting, you know, technology that would eventually go into Lucent Base Station. And we actually did an implementation of a 4x4 MIMO on uh, prototype base station with a prototype UE device that we showed at MWC way back when. So our job was to take some of the peer research from the Bell Labs organization and start to bring that into early implementation for Lucent products, right? So really, really great place to start off. I don't think I fully appreciated how good it was when it started, uh, but over time, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've had a better appreciation for what a great environment was, that was. Unfortunately, on the corporate side at that time, Lucent really started to go down. Right? So from a financial perspective, they weren't doing that well. It was kind of past the peak and the Nortel peak. And, uh, and from a company financial stability point of view, it was uh, kind of perpetual bad news. But from a work perspective, it was excellent. And... Well, here is my experience when it comes to graduating from university. When I was in university and about to graduate, I had no idea what types of jobs uh, were out there waiting for me. All I thought is, well, I didn't really know. I, I previously did uh, 
some software design as an intern, so I thought that was the only job available. Did you know what kind of jobs were out there, or did you just you took the first job that you, you were offered? Yeah, I took the first job. Like I actually didn't even interview for the job, right? So you know, I was I was back at school. I had finished all my coursework. I was they call it ABD, all but dissertation, right? So I was just working on my PhD dissertation. And I got a call one day from one of the managers in our group, and he basically on the spot offered me a job, right? So I didn't even have to interview, right? So I didn't question it. I didn't really ask him too much about, well, what exactly is the job? I just figured it's a great place to be. I knew the group. I knew the type of work that they were doing. And um, so basically, I didn't have like a great context of kind of what were the job options at the time. Lucin was a good company, lots of smart people working there, lots of interesting things to work on. Yeah, I'll go do it, right? So there was really no kind of master thought process behind it. And when I got there, the work was interesting, but part of the challenge was that, um, you know, the, the financial side of the business was getting tougher. Huawei was in the mix at that point. They were really kind of changing the price dynamic. And Lucent was a bloated company, so was Nortel. And some of that bloat was truthfully in the areas that I was working in, right? Yeah. So there had to be a tighter linkage between uh, between kind of forward-looking work and work that would actually make its way in a meaningful way into the product, right? So Ramsey, I would say, looking back, the part that was kind of unsustainable was that I didn't have really ever a great sense of products that Lucent sold, how they sold them. And we were too removed from the product development side of things and honestly didn't have that much accountability on the things that we were doing, right? And at the time, the company was performing really well. That was maybe acceptable, but going forward, that was just not going to be sustainable. And in hindsight, I realized that when I worked there, I could honestly say I had no clue, not much clue about these things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're not introduced to those things until we get into like the business side. Were, you, you were not exposed at all to the like product management uh, of Lucent? No, not really. I would say, honestly, not really. Like, you know, there was a, a gap between the stuff that we were doing and the stuff that actually was committed and funded product roadmaps. Uh, so, you know, in good faith, it was good. But it, was a, it was a really, you know, good job, very interesting, paid well, right? And as a group, you know, I don't know that we had that much accountability, but you know, at the time we just kind of roll with it. Right. Right. So, uh, Lucent was a huge organization. Like when I started, they probably had 70,000 employees. I don't know. Right. And then at that time they, they, you know, the financials were changing so drastically that they really had to cut back and it was just kind of shrinking from, from that point on. But in an organization that big, like it's really hard to, have a great sense of what others are doing. And I would say we were kind of happy in our little section doing interesting work and probably didn't really make that much effort to figure out how, I certainly didn't make that much effort to figure out how we fit into the big picture. And with 70,000 employees, it was, it was not easy to navigate anyway, right? So that was kind of the dynamic then. And all right, after, after Lucent, which... You weren't introduced to product management. You basically did whatever you want. You felt like it, or at least your group felt like it. Uh, where did you go? Yeah, from from Lucent, I went to Spirant. So I worked at Spirant uh, for a number of years, again, based in New Jersey, so still living in the U.S. at the time. And my first position at Spirant was on the product development side. So very, very different. Spirant was a publicly traded company, kind of a mid-sized company but really run as independent business units at the time, almost like a holding company. And uh, the business unit I worked for was the wireless business unit, which was brought into the aspirant mix through acquisition. So the parent company was TAS or TAS as it was known in the industry. And it was really a startup. Three guys who used to work at Bell Labs and really literally started the, the company out of, you know, the basement, you know, literally, right? And uh, grew it from there, eventually got purchased by Spire, but we're running it as an independent business unit at the time. When I started, two of the three original founders were still working. The third had kind of, you know, retired and 
and uh, and decided to do other things after they got acquired, right? And so the business unit was in total about 120, 150 people. So very, very different environment, very much run still like the uh, private company of the of the original owners, which was wonderful, and very much a kind of a action oriented. It was small enough that everybody had a role to play in terms of being in the value chain for generating revenue and winning successes with customers. Right? No, nobody was that far away from the customer. And I started on the product development side. We had been very successful in doing channel emulators, faders as they were known, right? And we were moving into the space of doing network emulators. We had network emulators on the CDMA side, and I was part of the development team that was working on the network emulator on the WCDMA side at the time, right? And uh, so I actually started in product development over there, which was great. So could you define a little bit uh, what product development is? Yeah, so we were basically responsible for implementing features, uh, working with customers, working with our product management team who are working directly with the customers in terms of prioritizing what our feature implementation was. At the time, we were developing a network emulator that was compliant with the 3GPP standard at the time I think it was release 5, going to release 6. And we also had to implement features that were in the in the in the specification right the major features in the specification the the network emulator was being used to test uh devices uh ues and smartphones and so we had to be quite uh ahead in terms of our feature implementation and compliance with the standard right so basically in our network emulator we had fpgas dsps we had power pc processors and we would implement parts of the 3gpp standard for base stations uh, in those various computing elements. And it was kind of a you know, lab-based, typical generic box, effectively, right? And we would be, our team was responsible for both uh, the implementation of the embedded PC type software and also the hardware of the box itself. Like it had lots of processing cards, backplane, connectivity, and it was a pretty complex piece of machinery we bought the base of it from another vendor uh, that kind of gave us the hardware framework and we would be responsible for all of the implementation on the various uh, processing components so in the product. Would, and would, that's, that's what we did. Would that be like the software? You were writing code to use the hardware or are you? what were you doing exactly? Yeah, embedded software, right? Embedded software would be DSP code, FPGA code primarily is what it was, right? right? And what did you enjoy about that job? Yeah, it was really bringing the standard to life. So I think that was the best part of it. Like you read 3GPP specs, which I knew quite well, but they were on paper, right? And to put those uh, specs into an actual working base station. And at the end of the day, we would have to connect up the device and have it attached to the network, have it make a voice call or a data call, right? And from the device's perspective, it thought it was communicating with a regular base station in uh, in its intended use, right? So for me, I think the best part of it was really taking something that was written on paper and to put it into a real implementation, right? And we generally did that very early because we were test equipment, right? Yep. So we were doing it, we were one, you know, one of the first new features, new functionality as a uh, you know, we had to basically align our feature implementation roadmap and time frame with those of our customers largely developing UEs and smartphones, right? Yeah. So sometimes we would be the first one that would validate a new feature on a device, right? So that was really good to be able to say that, yeah, that actually worked, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that was really the 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 most exciting part for me definitely being a kind of a wireless guy that was uh, um, you know really satisfying and and you were part of a team that wrote you weren't writing the code for everything you were were you, or actually let me ask you that were you writing the code for everything or were you part of a team, the team no i was part of a team no i was part of a team we were a fairly small team yeah. but as is the, the case for product development Part of what you do is new feature implementation. Part of what you do is bug fixing, right? Yeah. And in, in our world, actually, there's quite a lot of bug fixing because we are early, right? We are sometimes doing things, you know, the first time. 
And a lot of times we don't know if the bug is on the device side or if it's on our network emulator side, right? So a lot of it is root cause analysis, debugging, and trying to get things to work. Really good engineering work overall, right? And uh, but but part of a, a relatively modest team. I mean, we weren't a huge business unit or anything like that. But we would uh, just you know keep implementing features and trying to keep up with uh, with the roadmap that we had to you know we we had to stay kind of competitive in the industry, right? We were actually a little bit behind from our main competitors. So the challenge was to just to try to close that gap. And uh, in the test and measurement space, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you fall too far behind, you're quickly irrelevant, right? The other, the customers cannot, cannot wait around for you to implement features, right? Yeah. Yep. Been there. All right. Is there one thing you would change about that job? Uh, one thing I would change, I mean, to be honest with you, the piece of hardware that we were using was really, it was not that stable, right? So a lot of our time was, I mean, we inherited it. It's very difficult to then make a generational change in your hardware. You kind of got to stick it out and make the best of it, right? But we had a lot of instability in, in the hardware that we would have to try to debug and figure out, right? So the, the hardware itself wasn't really that conducive towards reliable manufacturing. Backplane was not great. And compared to the other products that Spirant was making, namely the faders, they were rock solid, right? Mm -hmm. So we did not choose to build this one from ground up. We chose to buy it from another, uh, you know, company in the industry. And I think that ended up being a mistake because we, we burned a lot of time just working on basic stability issues. Okay. So it was a time thing that instead of focusing on things that are important, you just try and end up debugging a hardware that you didn't choose to work with. Is that yeah, so 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 to put it in perspective, if I look at the feedback from our customers, the majority of it was not related to features, it was related to general stability, right? Okay. So so we would spend a lot of time working on those kind of stability root causes which were really elusive, right? And it was generally comes down to maybe a a poor design of the hardware, right? And uh, that's not an easy fix to make. You kind of have to stick it out until such time that you really feel like you've got a, a path to get to a next generation hardware. We were trying to catch up. We couldn't really afford to put things aside and build out a next generation hardware and still feel like we were in the window of being relevant, right? So that was a tough decision. And we had to kind of make the best of it, but it was not, not an ideal situation. Then. Okay. Then you moved on from that position. Where did you go? Yeah, so basically, uh, you know, in Spiron, we had a nice uh, concept, which was not put into action too often, but I was the beneficiary of it. It was really a rotational assignment, they would call it, right? So they would allow you to uh, spend some time in other parts of the organization in different roles. And it was more like a kind of check-in fee, right? You know, try this out if it's great and it leads to something where you're, it's kind of good for your career progression. You can certainly continue down that path, but not to the point where if you try it out and you think, that's ah, not a great fit for me, you can still come back to your original role, right? So we did have a rotational assignment. I was fortunate that they offered me the opportunity to do that and they moved me into a product management role, right? I had expressed an interest in doing that because I could see you know, there was a lot to be gained by having a tighter coupling with our key customers, you know, uh, basically owning the roadmap going forward was something I was certainly interested in, felt I was capable of doing. So they allowed me an opportunity to move to a rotational assignment in product management. And then eventually that became permanent quite quickly. So I moved to, uh, to the product management. Side. Okay. And how was your interaction with sales from a product manager's perspective? Uh, I quite enjoyed it. I mean, product managers, I think, have two perspectives. One is they kind of, for lack of a better term, stay in the office, right, and are less inclined to get out there and really assist the salespeople and work with customers. And I enjoyed that part of it. So I spent quite a bit of time out of the office in front of customers assisting our, our sales team with their opportunities. 
And uh, kind of the, the biggest thing was I was responsible for two products. One was our WCDM mini network emulator, the one that I was on the development team for. And then I also became the product manager for our, for our channel emulator product, which was a big revenue generator for us, right? And uh, within the customer base, we had some very large leading customers. And um, so basically, I, I had a good relationship with our sales team for those leading customers. They would really be the ones that drove our roadmap and validated our prioritization, right? And um, so basically, it was it was really, it was good. I got to know our sales team much, much better in that phase. And I would say that, and Ramsey, I could say I made a real effort to work with them, but truthfully, I, I just enjoyed it. I really enjoyed being more of a customer-facing role and supporting the sales team members. I think I built a lot of trust with them, too, just in terms of, uh, you know, willingness to uh, to help and assist with their customer engagements. And uh, it was kind of really refreshing to get out of the office and, and be out in, in the field. Okay. Uh, could you... Um... Uh, explain what a product manager does in like uh, 30 seconds or less? Yeah, I would say the product manager is responsible for the entire life cycle of the product, right? From uh, from developing the concept, proving out the business case, mapping out the features, planning the releases, uh, pricing, and also in market life cycle management, right? So as you evolve that product, for its usable life, as long as it's in the industry, uh, all the aspects of the product, really, you are like the kind of central point coordinating with your product development team, manufacturing team, support team, sales team, uh, field application engineers, and your customers as well. So you, you're basically deciding what goes into the product uh, as a feature, correct? Yeah, I would say you are deciding, but it's not independent, right? So basically, you have to work quite closely with the product development team because different features have a different, uh, you know, amount of effort required to implement them, right? Yeah. So you're basically trading off. Uh, you only have a finite amount of resources, development resources. They have to do credible estimates of feature implementation time. And you have to assess where you get the best bang for the buck in terms of how to plan your release cycle, both in terms of timing and market uptake, right? So you could have a feature that every customer really wants, but it may take you 18 months to develop that feature, right? right. And maybe in 18 months, it's not relevant anymore, right? Yep. Uh, so basically, you have to work closely with your product development team and get as many data points as you can from the customer base to make the best decision of how to map out the product roadmap and ultimately plan for releases, right? And you mentioned that some PMs like to visit customers and others like to stay in the office. How would the PMs who are staying in the office understand what the customer wants and when? I think they rely on the sales team to bring back that information. Okay. Right? So you can either get it firsthand or you can get it secondhand, say secondhand yeah. again, for lack of a better term, right? Yeah. No, that's a good term. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, what about, I've, I've worked with a few account managers and whenever we talk to a customer who needs a, like a feature done, I, the account manager ends up talking to the PM saying, hey, the customer needs it done now for a million dollar deal. And we all know it's not a million dollar deal. So how do you deal with that kind of situation? Or have yeah, you, have you, you know, seen that situation first? And if so, how do you deal with it? Yeah, so my approach would be, you know, I, I try to build uh, alignment, right? So everybody's kind of on the same page, right? I think that the, the kind of the the tension or tug of war between sales and product management would be product management is always thinking, do I believe you? Right. Is this true? Am I going to spend all my time to do this feature? And then the customer is like, I changed my mind. We don't really need it. Right. Or, uh, you know, you, you, you gave me X, but what I really told you I wanted was Y. Right. So there's some, something lost in the translation. Right. Mm -hmm. So from my point of view, I prefer to hear it firsthand. Right. 
in order to hear it firsthand. As you know, I'm sure you know, a lot of account managers are very protective of their customer relationship, right? Yes. And sometimes they have product people come in to the customer and promise them the moon and then never deliver because two weeks later they're hearing you know, a different story from another customer and they get distracted and go do that other stuff, right? Yeah. So there is a trust relationship with the sales team to um, be credible, uh, be knowledgeable in front of the customer and be, you know, open, easy, professional, easy to get along with, right? Clear in your communication and uh, be somebody that the customer actually values, you know, spending time with or getting a visit from, right? Yeah. So, so my first objective was to try to build that trust with the sales team such that I could get the information directly from the customer. And our industry is becoming so technical uh, that sometimes the language of the customer may not be best understood by some people on the sales side going forward, right? So it's a challenge on the sales side to keep up with uh, the requirements of what the customer is asking for to really be able to speak their language, understand what their requirements are. As a product manager, as much as I could, I tried to hear that directly and so that I could take it's not somebody else's interpretation of what the customer needs. If I'm going to commit to it, I would rather own it. If I make a mistake, if I say the customer needs this by this date and I believe it'll result in this business, if we do it and it never happens, then it's my mistake. Right? Yep. It's not something that I heard secondhand. It was a call I had to make and I have to live with the consequences, right? And um, so I was okay with that. I'd rather have that kind of responsibility directly in my hands rather than getting indirect information. So that was the, that was the general approach I tried to do as much as I could, right? Nice. Okay. That, that, that works for me. That's actually very good. Uh, all right. So you did the product management thing. Uh, then you moved on to own your own company. Is that correct? Yeah, I actually joined our family business for a while. So I had that kind of, you know, I guess Ramsey, I would say I'm the type of person, to be honest, right? That if I have an itch, I just kind of got to scratch it, yep. right? It's not going to go away, right? So I understand that. That's, that's I've always kind of followed the things that I would find to be more, most interesting. And part of it was seeing what it was like to really, you know, run your own company and, uh, and move away from kind of the traditional corporate side of things. So I joined the family business. It was a very low-tech business. It was an automotive space, really on the kind of chemicals and equipment side for the service side of the automotive space. Our family had been in that business for quite some time, and there were some good growth opportunities, I thought, there. And it was something I thought, you know, let me try it and see how it goes. It also coincided with the time that we moved from the U.S. back to Canada, right? So we were moving back to, to, to the Toronto area. And I had a choice of kind of, you know, continuing on in the industry or trying to do something, you know, different, right? So the opportunity was available for me to, uh, you know, try things out at the family business. So I, I decided to go ahead and do it. Did you enjoy being your own boss? Or were you your own you boss? You know, I, yeah, I would say I was, I was within the definition of being my own boss. Yeah, I mean, we had, a, our company had about 15 people overall, right? And I would say that I was ultimately responsible for, you know, kind of the buck stops here. That was kind of my role, right? Yeah. So, um, so it was good. I mean, parts of it I really enjoyed. It was, it was fun to do. It was, you know, completely autonomous, you know, having control and, 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 and the ability to make decisions in that direction, right? And, uh, and then at the end of the day, I, I thought I'd done as much as I could. There was probably an inflection point. So truthfully, again, you know, you can kind of set a direction, but you all have to be on the same page in terms of the direction that you want to go. So we were very much a local GTA in Toronto kind of business, right? And there was an opportunity for us to grow nationally, right? And, uh, and I, I certainly wanted to do so because I saw that, you know, there was going to be a lot of upside. But... You know, the kind of character of the family business can be such that you're pretty happy in the domain that you're in and not really of the appetite of taking on too many additional risks, right? Yeah. So there was nothing wrong with the existing business. It was doing fine. It was profitable. There was a limited amount of incremental growth, but I would say that the overall preference was not to chase the growth. It was just to kind of continue 
being successful in the area that we were already in, right? So in that respect, I said, okay, that's fine. That's as far as I can take things. And if the overall preference is not to continue to kind of pursue growth opportunities, there's, there's a limited amount of additional value that I can bring or interest really that I would have in kind of continuing on with that, right? right. So I'd say the time I spent there was great. But uh, for me, like, you know, it, it, I, need, I, I wanted to take, you know, more risks and look for more growth. And I could certainly see that that was not the, the preference. That would take people out of the comfort zone. And that was not really, it was not worth it at the end of the day to, 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 to kind of force changing the character of the company, right? Nice. So, uh, so, so I thought that that kind of reached a conclusion. And it was, it was, I'm glad I did it, but there was a limited amount of, additional interest for me to continue to do it okay all right well and then you moved uh, to another so you you moved quite a quite a bit like you, well let me put it this way you've been in the business for a long time so you've had the opportunities to try different things what did you try next yeah you know what's weird Ravi? i gotta tell you like for for whatever reason i tend to go in three or four year patterns and right? i feel like i'm continuously like doing a, a degree right yeah yeah I stay in a place for like three or four years and then I just end up kind of, you know, moving on to something else and it's worked for me. Okay. I've again, followed my interest and so far, you know, knock on wood, it's been a pretty good pattern, right? Yeah. So far I've so, followed the same but, pattern as well. <laughs> I think it's good enough to make a meaningful contribution, but if you don't think that that's really what you want to do indefinitely, it's like you learned, contributed, taken some experience away from that and then I always feel like okay there's something else I'd like to do more right nice and I try to figure out a way to move into the next thing it's worked all right it's worked all right for me I hope for you too yeah me too <laughs> we'll find out uh, <laughs> all right so, so you, then I did I go ahead. so then I did move back to Spiron right so the opportunity opened up Spiron had gone direct in Canada they were working with a distributor prior to that yep they had gone direct in Canada and um, and I, I maintained really good relationships with the team there, and they had an opportunity for an SE role in the Canadian market, and uh, they were happy to bring me back on, right? And, you know, the kind of comment was at the time was, you know, Salim, are you sure you're going to want to do this? And when I was like, what do you mean? So that's a local Canadian account, and, you know, you've done, like, global product management before. And I go, no, no, for sure. I'd, I'd love to do it, right? So... Uh, so basically, I was the SE in the Canadian market. At the time, BlackBerry was still a strong account. We had some of the m and accounts, which were pretty good as well. And uh, so basically, I was back into a customer-facing role, now part of this, the sales team, but in, a, in an SE role. How would you compare the SE role to the product management role? Uh, I think the product management role is better defined. The SE role, I think the product management role, to be honest, from company to company is not the same necessarily, but has similar characteristics, right? If you've been a product management at one place and, you, and you know, you're kind of trying to be as marketable as you can and apply to other product management roles, I think generally those other companies have a decent sense and trust your experience in that role, right? I think if you're an SE, I feel like the phrase is kind of, I'm not overly happy with it, right? Yep. I think that different companies manage their SE resources differently, right? And um, I think at the time, Spirit did not do a great job. Like the part of the SE role that, that I personally didn't like is that it was a two-man role, right? So there was an account manager and there was myself, right? Yep. And at the end of the day, it's easy for the SD to feel kind of like subordinate, right? You are measured on account at success, but you are not principally owning the account relationship or driving the strategy to win that success. It's highly dependent on who your partner is, right? Yes. And it's kind of a partnership, but not really, because at the end of the day, the account manager kind of trumps. If you have a different way of approaching the account or something to consider, in most places, the account manager could trump you, right? Yeah. And, and in my particular case, the account manager who I was partnered with, I mean, I, I think he, he, he meant well, he intended, you know, his intentions were good, but 
you know, to be a good account manager from what I've seen, like it's not rocket science. You just really have to be a, a good listener and be able to, you know, have some trust with the relationship, be personable and be approachable for the customer, be a good internal seller so that your company will prioritize and trust what you're bringing as far as customer facing information goes. Right. And, uh, the other part of it is you have to be just organized and diligent, right? I mean, a lot of sales is just staying on top of things, right? Yep. And and so from my perspective, I, I truthfully have to say I didn't love, you know, our good friend, Kuyan knows who, who the account manager was in the Canadian market. Very good person on a personal level, not a great fit for the account manager role, right? Mm-hmm. And so my individual experience, the SEO role was fine, but being in that kind of two person, I much prefer putting SEs in different roles, like a technical account manager, where you really have a clear ownership and directive and autonomy to pursue that directive accountability, right? If you're accountable, you want to be in control of what you're accountable for, right? Or the other side is you have truthfully a good team selling approach, right? And it, the, the two-man approach, you're so dependent on the person that you work with. And as an SD, you're generally the junior in that relationship. Yep. And it can sometimes not work out to be great, right? Yep. In the team selling approach, you're really working as a coordinated team. You could have an overall account owner. You could have a technical account manager, say, for a, a telco such that you were focusing one guy on the wireline opportunities and one person on the wireless opportunities. And as soon as it's more than two, it's a team, right? Yep. Uh, so I personally prefer just really owning the goals myself or working within a true team environment. But the two-man operation, not my favorite, to be honest. Okay. So I, I do have a few notes more than anything. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, I noticed, at least uh, my for my stint at Spirant, when you're working one-on-one with a account manager, Depending on the personalities of the two, the SE could either turn into an assistant or a gopher, uh, or they can turn into like an advisor. And it's not something that like the SE has some control over it, but it's also the account manager. Because if the account manager is threatened by the still uh, by the skills of the SE, they'll try to you know uh, hurt the SE just so that they won't take their job in the end. At least that's from my experience. I don't know what you have seen with regards to that. Yeah, I I would agree with you, Ramsey. I'll put it in slightly different terms. So to me, I think that when you look at that kind of two-person operation, the role of the account manager is very clearly defined, right? And the role of the SE is less defined, right? It's not like they're saying, this is the job description of the SE account manager. You have to work within this job description. I find that the SEs are a little bit less protected, right, in terms of not being at just the whim of the account manager. It's okay to work in a find your right balance, right? You're always going to be kind of in a team where you do have to find your right balance. But I find at the end of the day, yeah, that gopher kind of role does happen quite a bit. Hey, you know, do a demo, go support this customer, report back, tell me what's going on. But then when it comes to the serious business of actually putting together a commercial offer and figuring out who you're competing against and what your strategy is going to be. Sometimes you don't have as much a voice at the table and you have a lot to ask, right? So you're not sure if your voice is really going to be heard at the end of the day. And the other part of it that I personally don't like is, I mean, from my experience, most account managers, their comp plan is 50-50, right? And they're completely measured on just how much do you sell, right? And an SE might be more base and less, less variable, like maybe like an 80-20 was not uncommon, right? Yep. And uh, so inherently, you kind of feel like, I don't have quite as much skin in the game. You got to defer to the person who's got the most skin in the game, right? Yeah. But then I think that it creates a very ambiguous role for the SC, right? And to be honest with you, Ramsey, my pet peeve is I hate the term, the SC term. I really don't like it, right? So, you know, sometimes they say, you know, pretend like you're a systems engineer, like you're not part of the sales team. That happens too, right? Yeah. They say, SE, go there, work with the customer, but don't look like you're really selling, right? Yeah. And I go, okay, what am I supposed to do? I'm here to generate <laughs> business, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, nothing happens if you don't sell anything. So, whatever. Customers are not dumb. They know you're there for a purpose. 
And if you can create a win-win situation, bring something good for them, what's wrong with that, yeah. right? Yeah. Or you say, I'm a sales engineer, but you're supposed to be technical. Maybe you don't own the commercial side. Do they go to you for pricing or do they just go to you for technical questions? What do I go to the account manager for? Like, it's kind of ambiguous, right? Yeah. And the account manager has an easy out. Oh, anything technical, go ask the FD, right? Yep. They can just opt out of whatever they don't want to do, right? Yeah, I, I, and punt it over to the FD, right? I, I, felt, that's not I, great. I felt like I can opt out of all pricing conversations. Uh, note that I had a good sales guy. Like, uh, I was more of a trusted advisor for him than I was a gopher, which made me happy. Uh, so whenever there was a pricing situation, I would just send the the account manager the not the like part numbers, and he would figure out the pricing that he would provide. Uh, that being said, a lot of a lot of SEs would prefer being on the eighty twenty with less control than being fifty fifty with more control, just because they want to be employees more than they want to be sales folks. Uh, if you uh, understand what I'm trying to say. Well, I gotta be honest with you, Ramsey. I have a problem with that because I would ask every SE, "What's your career path?" If your career path is to be an account manager, and this is a challenge because from the SE, sometimes the career path is not quite obvious, right? Yes. There's an obvious one of trying to become an account manager, but you are in the field. You are generally in the region, co-located with your customers, right? So uh, what, what are your other choices? If you really want to be an account manager, two things I would say right away. Number one is don't opt out of the commercial discussions because you need that experience. If you're going to go take that next career step, you need to know those things, right? Number two is you got to get accustomed to a higher variable pay, right? Yes. If you really want to become an account manager, you'd probably say, I need to have more skin in the game, Right. Uh, there was a really good rep that Puyan and I used to work with in Chicago, and he'd tell me stories about the start of his career. A great salesperson, right? And he would insist very early. He was the only uh, income earner in his family. His wife was like a homemaker, right? Yep. And he would insist on having a zero one hundred entirely variable pay plan, right? Yep. And he just believed that I've got to figure out a way to make this work. I'd rather focus on the upside, right? 80-20 is okay, but I feel like the upside is not enough to really move the needle that much, right? It's not. And uh, it's a safe. It's the safe play, yeah. right? You got a little skin in the game, but not that much, right? Yeah. Which is okay, but if really your career path is that you want to become an account manager, you better get accustomed to having more variable pay. And you better feel confident enough that the upside is worth the risk and that you trust that you will, you have the right product to offer. You have the right relationship with the customer and you have the right approach to turn that into a success. Right. Yeah. I do want to note that almost 90% of the SEs that I've known and worked with have been SEs over 10, like some of them have been 15 years SEs as in, that is their career path. They don't want to move on from being there, which is why they're okay, like passing on the like, commercial conversation. But yes, you are correct. If you want to do something different, then you have to work on those skills to become something different. You're not going to become that. So then, right? be you know, Ramsey, my, you know what my pushback would be on that? I think the SEs are underappreciated, right? I think for the value that you bring and the experience that you have, I don't think it's a fully appreciated role, right? I would much prefer to see the SE career path evolve to being a technical account manager, right? Yeah. A credible, a credible and equal counterpart to me be a global account manager, a key account manager, whatever it is, right? Because, you know, going forward, it's hard to be in, in a technology sales role if you cannot speak the language, right? And you end up being kind of the interpreter for the account manager, and going forward, like if I, if it were my company and I look for the type of people that I would hire, like if you can speak the language of the customer, if you can keep up with the, uh, you know, technical side of things, if you're good at listening and eliciting requirements, if you're trusted uh, with the customer, all the commercial side stuff is fairly easy. Like you can pick that up really quickly, right? Yep. But a person who cannot speak that technical language 
to pick that up is really, really hard. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I'm if I look at it, in my experience, even being at the MNO, I look at three companies kind of at the top of the food chain, right? Apple, Google, Qualcomm, right? And if I look at the people that they put in front of the customer, when I was, I we worked at TELUS, right, for four years after, you know, my role at Spiron, and I would be on the other side of the, of the vendor relationship, right? Yep. And if I look at, the, if I look at those companies, there's no non-technical account manager. It doesn't exist anymore. It's just not useful enough, right? So, so everybody that they put in front of the customer is credible. Okay. It's credible. Can me, talk with the engineering folks, can talk with the product folks, can talk with procurement folks, can talk with whoever. So for the technical account manager, is he accompanied by an SE or is he both the SE and the account manager? I think it depends on the nature of the company, right? So going forward, like you have, like truthfully, so if I look at the SEs, you know, you could be a 10-year SE and feel like your job is pretty protected, but the landscape is continually shifting. You got to stay on your toes, right? So my traditional view of an SE is still an SE that is accompanied with kind of a hardware-oriented base product, right? You have to go in and show the product, do the demos, help the customer to use the product and everything like that, right? I don't see quite the same personally. I haven't thought about this that much and this kind of thing off the top of my head now, right? Yep. But I don't see the same kind of SD role in a software or SaaS-based you know, a product area, right? Okay. And uh, from that point of view, I think that that shifts more to being a technical account manager, right? Okay. So, uh, so, so that's where I feel like you know that kind of evolution kind of kicks in, right, in my opinion. All right. Uh, all right, we'll just leave it at that, and people can look at look at the different software companies and see if there's SE roles out there. Um, maybe in the future it'll all be technical account managers. Maybe not. We'll we'll see. I I do want to move on to like the business development title that you've you held for a while. For sure. Because yeah, for sure. I've worked with different companies and each company has its own definition of what a business development manager is. Do you mind defining what yours is or was? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty awful description because it's kind of a catch-all of we're not really sure what this is, right? <laughs> so go out there and figure it out, right? Yeah. So it can, sometimes I've heard such bad connotations like people are like, oh, you do business, biz dev, that means you probably play golf all day, right? Like you're the schmoozer, right? That's all you do, right? Yeah. And uh, sometimes people with that title, maybe that's what they do. I don't know. I never did that. Right? All, that's all I can say, right? Yeah. So from my point of view, the biz dev role I've had is um, when you're introducing a new product or trying to get into a new segment of the market that you're not in currently, right? And you have to go out there's customer-facing role, and you have to basically figure out what's going to work, like what you're trying things out, right? What's going to get you a foot in the door? What's going to give you traction? And in general, in my the ask of the biz dev when I've been in that role is to win the first or first two deals, right? Prove that you can win something, right? What does it take for the company to put together a package and an offering that the customer will actually sign up for when we've never sold that before, right? And the idea is once you've done the first one or two deals, that then you can turn that into more of a standard offering and roll that out to your to the sales team. You know, in the language that some companies use, I've heard AWS kind of uses this. It's like a find a problem, find a solution, find other people that have the same problem, offer them the same solution. Right? right. So it's really doing the first two things, finding the problem with the with the key credible customer, launch customer, and finding a solution that they're actually willing to sign up for. And then being able to articulate what the problem was and why your solution solved their problem in a way that allows you to build a pitch that then you can take to other cu customers that have that same problem, right? So but that's the best description I can give you. And sometimes it's open-ended. You don't know how long that's going to take. You hit some dead ends along the way, right? right. And, uh, and the environment can change on you, right? So generally for biz dev, the hardest part is to come up with a credible set of objectives that measure whether you're actually succeeding or not right okay. there's a lot of unknowns that you got to deal with right 
So what happens after you sold your two deals? Are you fired? Or yeah, that's a good question. Right? <laughs> that was always that, the that risk. Would, that would right? suck. We don't need you anymore. Yeah, you, you <laughs> did your job. Now go away. We, we don't need you anymore. So basically, there's probably three or four different paths. One is they could fire you. I guess that's an option, right? Yeah. Two is you could move into the sales team because you know the product, you know the solution. As you move that into more of a standard product, you could certainly move to the sales team. Three is you could move to the next thing on the biz dev side, the next thing that you're trying to introduce to the market and figure out how you're going to do it. Or the fourth one would be you'd move to another role like product management type role or whatnot. Right. Okay. But you know, we'd always say that we would joke around that same thing. Like once you get the first two sales, they don't need us anymore. They just get rid of us. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that thought does cross your mind, and maybe that's kind of a negative incentive. You have an incentive to drag it out longer. <laughs> well, if you drag it out longer, you're going to be fired because you're not doing a good job. And if you do a good job and right. finish early, you might get fired because you finished your job. But obviously, that's it's more a of a catch twenty two. It's more of a joke because <laughs> if you did such a good job, they would want to keep you on to be either the salesperson for that product or to be uh, the business development person for the next product. But yeah, that's yeah you know, in, in, in our, in my biz dev role at Spiring, like we were introducing the, the one box tester, which we weren't in, we would do more systems racks of test, uh, you know, test equipment. Yep. And um, so the expectation was the one box tester earlier in the R and D cycle, right? You'd have to engage with customers earlier, more than what we were accustomed to in terms of our account relationship. So we did talk about that. What would be the evolution of the biz dev team? And basically that section of the market opportunity was sufficiently different from all the other things that we did that the expectation is we would become an overlay, an overlay okay. sales team okay. specializing in that particular area, right? All right, perfect. So we are running out of time. I, I do want to touch on uh, make what are you doing right now? And then maybe we'll move on to the not so fire round. So uh, what's your role currently today? Yeah, so I started with Idemia in, in August, right? And Idemia is a new name in the industry, but two older companies that merged together, Oberther Technologies and Morpho. They were two of the top four SIM vendors in the industry. And uh, they merged together about a year ago and rebranded as Idemia based out of Paris, based out of, you know, French-run uh, company. And they do business with all the major MNOs, a lot of the OEMs, car manufacturers these days, IoT type use cases. They also do financial products like credit cards, and they actually are the one of the major suppliers of passports and driver's license, and they do the global entry system in the U.S. and all these types of things. Right? So my role within that company is the solution sales side for the mobile operators in North America. And that's largely focused on eSIM based opportunities now. So eSIM has really kind of turned the corner. You see it in products like the Apple Watch, the next generation of iPhones. And all of that has really changed the way in which the SIM is offered from a product based offering to a service based offering. And so that's my role now in the North American market. I'm working for Idemia Mobile Operator Business Unit, as it would be called, and working on the called digital solution side. Okay, so you are in sales. You moved on from sales engineering and product management to become a full-time salesperson. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, we are like an overlay sales team. We okay. do have account managers that work directly with the MNOs and largely are responsible for the traditional SIM products. And we have a global overlay team that is responsible for the next generation. We call them the digital solutions. And I'm part of that team in the North America region. Okay, and uh, how... How would you compare that? Which do you did you prefer, being a salesperson or an SE? Based on the conversations before, I think I have an idea of where you're going to go, but I'd like to hear from you. Yeah, you know, I, I certainly feel like, you know, I like the SE at the time, but where I am now, definitely the role that I'm in now, right? Yep. So it is really a technical account management role, I would say, is the best way to describe it, right? Okay. And, uh, and it's good. I think for us, the biggest challenge is moving our commercial models from product-based to services-based, which is a common theme yeah. over the last 10 years in the industry. And, uh, but overall, like, you know, I, I quite enjoy the role that I have right now, okay. at least for the next three years. Right. So we'll see if my, <laughs> my four year cycle <laughs> kind of continues on. Right. Yeah. So good. All right. So let's, let's move on to the fire round, if that's okay with you. Uh, or not yeah, so, sure. Go ahead. It's supposed to be a not so Bring fire it round, but we are running out of time, so let's do it as a <laughs> fire round. Uh, I've changed it out a little bit. If you, if you've heard it in the past, 
But for now, out of all your jobs, uh, excluding what you're doing today, which was your favorite? Uh, biz dev for Spirant on our one box tester. I love the guys I worked with. We had a great team. We had so much fun in that job. Okay. And which one did you hate the most? Which one did I hate the most? Yeah. I would probably say in the end product development at Spirant because our just hardware product was so flaky. It was really hard to get anything done on that platform. It became very, very tiring, very tiring. Is there a book or resource every SE who wants to transition into sales should read? I don't have one. I think the best is just mentors, people in the industry, getting a few different perspectives and experience has always been the approach I would encourage and have taken myself. I think it's hard to capture that in a single book and things change all the time. So I would just say stay on your toes, talk to a lot of people, find people that you trust and share experiences and never feel like it's a one-way relationship it's two ways all the time you always have part of your experience to share and so does the other person right okay so that also answers my last question which was any advice you would give an se who wants to transition into sales do you have something else you'd want to advise yeah i think for me ramsey to be honest if you look at the way the world is going don't discount your technical side and your customer relationship You know, I think sometimes people think that sales is some magic world, like there's some magic formula to be good at it. It's really just common sense, having the right personality, um, you know, building trust with customers, being pretty organized in terms of how you approach your day, your week, your month, your quarter, your year, right? And all of those things, I think if you're kind of above average, now you don't have to be a superstar, but if you're above average at each one of those things, you'll be good in sales. But the part going forward, I think, that is becoming more and more critical is everything is technical. Your customer is more technical. There used to be this layer of middle management that would rely on technical teams to tell them what they needed, right? Yep. That's all gone. Right? Everybody you deal with is proficient and a subject matter expert in the areas that they're responsible for, right? Yep. So don't discount that you really need that part in order to be successful. And that's the hardest part for people who don't have it to learn. Right. The other stuff of basic, you know, kind of account management principles, I think it's pretty straightforward otherwise. And sometimes at these, we discount the stuff that we know really well and actually has a lot of value going forward. Right. So I do encourage SEs to really think about the value that they bring, the skill set that they have, and recognize that it's going to be even more valuable going forward. Perfect. That's a perfect way to end the show. Thank you, Salim, for Perfect. joining me today. I appreciate it. My, my pleasure, Ramsey. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. And this brings us to the end of the show. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really enjoyed talking to Salim. Thank you, Salim, for coming on, for being open about your choices, why you made them, and how it's shaped your career, and your motivation to go from one uh, job to the next. I I liked how you how Salim equated working for four years in each job is kind of like getting a university degree, and that was an interesting observation. So show notes are at we the sales engineers dot com slash show forty four, or if you don't want to type all that, it's we the se's dot com slash show forty four. If you believe like I do that books improve your life, sign up to the book club. I'm trying to build the communities there, as I did, I mentioned in the intro. Um, It'll, it'll help us come together as a community of SEs because I cannot find a big community of SEs that works together. So sign up. Let's learn together. And you can do that at wethesees.com slash book club. I think that's enough for today. I talked a lot during the intro, so let's keep it short and sweet. Thank you guys for listening. With that, this is Ramsey signing off.